We're going to spend a lot of time in this section making sure you can get the display you want. When the trace on the screen doesn't make sense or it isn't what you expect to see, we're going to show you what to do and how to start making adjustments. And the adjustments we'll be talking about are going to be voltage gain, time base, trigger position, the trigger slope. That's what being a DSO user is all about. And learning to make these adjustments on real world cars just like the ones that show up in your service bay is what this class is all about. Don't worry if you're not real familiar with lab scopes. We're going to go way back to the basics and make this simple. When you first start making these adjustments with these tools, it can seem a bit overwhelming. So be sure to use the website newobd2.com. It'll help you set up your DSO, particularly on the manufacturer specific side where we show you specifically how to set up particular lab scopes. If your brand and your model is not there, take the time to vote. So it'll be one of the next ones we do. And we also want to take time to think some manufacturers provided us with equipment, PicoScopes and Automotive Test Solutions. We use these two because they're excellent products and they work well with video production like we're doing. Take the time to look at their products. But let's get back. We're going to start at the very lot bottom level. The lines that form vertical and horizontal grids on the screen. The spaces between these lines are called divisions. And they may have even been divided into subdivisions. And they're used as a rulers. And they're going to help you measure the time and voltage. Now the horizontal lines going up the screen represent the voltage divisions. The vertical lines going across the screen represent time divisions. And the values of all these can be set. Let's take a look at some examples. These are generics. And you never see a grid bright and sharp because it interferes with looking at your scope pattern sometimes. Most of the times, these are well ghosted back. Now we have this thing set up for one volt per division. So going up those horizontal lines, each one represents one volt. Going across left to right, each one of these squares represents one millisecond. Let's look at some subdivisions. Sometimes you see small tick marks in between to help you make interpretations. We're going to show you how to make measurements easier. But let's start with a simple square pulse. It goes straight up seven of those divisions and is about seven volts. Because remember, we're on, on one volt per division and this takes seven divisions. Some scopes will say this is the 10 volt scale, meaning the top out is 10 volts. Pay attention to the manufacturer specific stuff on the website. We'll tell you about those situations. Now we measure time. We measure it from left to right. We're pointing to a second pulse here. They're both the same size. But one starts at 5 milliseconds and goes to 6 milliseconds. That is one division. And since we're at one division per millisecond, that is one millisecond in time. Now, we were looking at the high up there. We would also could be looking at the low portion. In this case, it goes from 3 to 5, and that's 2 milliseconds in time. But if we want to make real precise measurements, we go beyond the grid and we'll use cursors. Cursors are dotted lines we can put on the screen by freezing the patterns and moving them around. Let's show you a couple of these cursors. These are vertical cursors going across like the vertical lines that measure time. We put one cursor at the start of the measurement and one at the end, and the scope tells us the time. Notice these patterns, unlike the last two, don't start exactly at the two and three millisecond mark. There are something in between. So anytime we need to make a precise measurement, and we'll show you places where this is important, like measuring the RPM on a fuel pump, time gets to be very important. It tells us the RPM the pump is running. It's one of our critical measurements. So these are not just theoretical things. You'll see all these things used in the diagnostic training on the website. We could also be looking at the downtime like we did before. We see our two milliseconds, the time between the start and the finish. That's the measure of time. We could do the same thing with voltage. Now, this signal goes up a little more than seven divisions. We put our line up there. It says 7.13 volts. Now it's important to remember that on most scopes, the starting spot is assumed to be zero volts automatically. You don't have to position it. As you position the top line, it tells you how far it is from the zero point. Other scopes let you have two cursors. 
Again, go to the website, look at the manufacturer specific instructions. But let's go look at what this looks like on a real scope. This is an actual measurement on our Pico scope. We're measuring the pulse width here. The value is shown there. We've written it out in big writing so you can read it. You see the start point on the left and the end point on the right. And they are between the grids at the bottom. The start point is a little before 2 milliseconds. It ends a little before 3 millisecond point. This measures out to be 942 microseconds. Now just keep in mind, there's a thousand microseconds in a millisecond. So what you could also say is, this is 0.9424 milliseconds. Some of these measurements are going to be very small. But again, we're going to show you where it's going to be used in the diagnostics. Here's a voltage measurement. We're going to use our, our zero volt as a reference. We bring the top cursor down. It becomes the end. The start isn't shown in this particular case because the Pico assumes zero as the starting spot. This display reads 7,379 millivolts. Remember, there's a thousand millivolts per volt. So what that really is, 7.379 volts. Pretty accurate measurement. The accuracy really depends on how carefully you position it on the trace. So now you've had a chance to see this. But look, we can also do the zero point. The zero on these pulses is 0.592 volts or 592 millivolts. We could be measuring the low point. This can help you find ground return problems on solenoids and so forth. There's a lot of different measurements. Let's talk about the scales now. We've looked at one scale, and scales can be very important. We have seen a common mistake. Let's talk about a common mistake right here before we start. Changing scales when you should not. Let's move on down and look at a pulse. We'll talk about it. We start off on a 50-volt scale, and we're measuring an 8-volt signal. Actually, that does no harm. It just makes the signal a little bit small. It's actually very usable. But we'd probably be better off. If we put it on a 10 volt scale, we can see that it is an 8 volts. Now, one of the dangers is we could be looking at an 8 volt signal on a 5 volt scale and it looks perfectly normal, except for that red overrange icon we told you in the upper left up there. This overrange warning has to be paid attention to. Anytime you have that, you are on the wrong scale. Now, it's on the scale on the left because it'll be on whichever side the scale is wrong. As you look at the values, you can see that this one looks like 5 volts, that one looks like 8. They're both really 8 volts. One of the other errors we see frequently made is people look at a signal when they're expecting 5 or 8, and the signal looks smaller, they run the scale down to make it look bigger. We told you at the beginning to use manufacturer information to know what you're expecting. Even if you read in a book that says it's a 5 volt digital signal, you know it's 5 volts. If you're looking at a crank or cam hall effect and it's a half a volt, don't make the screen bigger so you can see how good this half a volt is. Most hall effects run significantly more than half a volt. Most 5, 8, some of them are 10 volts, some are even battery voltage. And we've gone into shops where they say, well, the crank looks good, but I don't have a signal. We look at it, and they're down on a 1 or 2 volt scale looking at this small signal. Look, it's nice and clean. It's got nice square shoulder. Square shoulders at 1 volt will not trigger a circuit set up to run at 5, 8, or 10 volts. Remember, the average rule, an 8 volt signal is going to make a distinction between high and low somewhere in the vicinity of 4 volts. A 5 volt signal is going to make a distinction between high and low somewhere around 2.5 volts. Also apply that to noise. Noise and interference in this signal isn't going to have an effect until it gets to be about one half actual amplitude of the signal when it crosses that midpoint. Don't make a wrong change. Don't make the voltage scale too small. Don't blow up a small signal to make it look big. Go in expecting to see what you expect to see and then see what's there.